Welcome to Hot Chips 18. Keynote 1. Cool Codes for Hot Chips. Good morning. It's my honor and pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for the day, Justin Ratner. Justin Ratner is Intel Senior Fellow, Director of the Corporate Technology Group, and the Chief Technology Officer of Intel. In 1989, Justin was named Scientist of the Year by R&D Magazine for his contributions to parallel and distributed computing architecture. In 1996, he was featured as Person of the Week in ABC World News for his work on Department of Energy's ASCII Red System, the first machine to sustain trillion operations per second. In 1997, Justin was honored as one of 200 people, 200 individuals having the greatest impact on computer industry. Justin is a long-standing member of Intel's Research Council and Academic Advisory Council. I'm very happy and thankful that Justin is able to take some time off from his busy schedule to be with us here today. I'm especially thankful because this is his personal vacation day and not just any vacation day, it's a special day, it's his wedding anniversary. <laughs> so it's, uh, <clears throat> let's congratulate him on the special day and, and welcome Justin to Hot Chips. Thank you. I had to get a uh, special dispensation from my wife uh, to do this when uh, Pradeep and uh, the rest of the program committee was pressing me to, uh, to commit. You know, it was one of those really sheepish conversations with your, with your spouse, your significant other. Um, you know, hon, uh, they'd like me to give this talk. Oh, that sounds great. Gee, where is it? Oh, it's in Palo Alto. Oh, gee, neat, blah, blah, blah. I said, except it's on our anniversary. <laughs> Anyway, she's, uh, she's with me. Uh, she's, uh, I think, headed over to the shopping center, so she'll probably do significant damage uh, while we're here. <laughs> so my credit card while we're here this morning. But anyway, I'm, I'm, happy, to, I'm happy to be here, and uh, you know, we'll, uh, we'll enjoy the rest of the afternoon uh, together. Uh, this, uh, this keynote has, has, a, has an interesting origin. Not only did I have to commit on my anniversary, but I was really getting hounded for, for a title. And I, I tend to be a little more spontaneous than, than that. So trying to you know, pick a title uh, you know, four or five months uh, in advance of the, of the actual meeting can be a challenge. But uh, I happen to be visiting uh, Princeton uh, on campus for, a, um, for an engineering advisory council. I sit on the computer science council. And uh, we found some time, Kylie and I found some time to sneak off and just, uh, and just chat. And the subject of, um, of really lacking a, uh, a base of, of applications that could really drive the development of multi-core and on into, into many-core architecture uh, was sort of our central uh, conversation. And you know, as we sat there along with J.P. Singh and some of the other uh, graduate students, so, you know, we really began to think that it was time to, um, you know, to put everyone to work on creating uh, a suite of codes that would really provide a, a foundation for, uh, for quantitative design. So finally went back, typed that reply, saying, OK, here is the title of the talk, which, uh, which, you, see, um, which you see here. So I'm going to take uh, the next uh, 45 minutes or so, and then allow some time for questions, just kind of uh, sharing with, with you my thoughts on sort of the state of affairs here in terms of uh, having a quantitative basis for designing uh, these uh, uh, increasingly 
uh, aggressive multi-core uh, designs and, and some of the steps we intend to take. So let me grab the remote and let's, uh, let's get started and we'll have a few, a few demonstrations uh, along the way. So uh, I'm sure uh, everyone's familiar with uh, the work by uh, Dave Patterson and John Hennessy, which really put uh, computer architecture onto a, uh, a quantitative uh, basis. And many benchmarks have played a, uh, a significant role, really a key role, in, um, in providing architects and, and designers uh, with a reference point um, upon which they can evaluate uh, their designs, uh, upon which they can uh, tune and optimize their design. Now, the most noteworthy of these benchmarks, of course, has been the, has been the spec suite and through uh, many evolutions, 95, 2000, and onto the current um, spec benchmarks. Uh, other benchmarks have played significant role if you're designing server architectures, of course, TPC, and in particular, uh, the TPCC benchmark today, and uh, its evolution now into H and E and so forth. Uh, other benchmarks have uh, provided different roles in the, in the industry, SysMark, uh, for example, and MobileMark uh, for mobile processors and 3D uh, for looking at graphics performance. So over the years, uh, we've actually built up a fairly substantial array of these suites of codes that, uh, that drive us uh, and provide that, uh, that quantitative uh, foundation for uh, design. I guess I should press this before I get in trouble. Um, of course, what we, what we all observe is that um, this trend towards multi-core uh, processors is accelerating and, and accelerating quite uh, quickly. Uh, you know, various companies have announced uh, their plans to, uh, to move forward beyond uh, today's uh, high volume dual core processors to quad core designs and, uh, and beyond. Uh, my company uh, is uh, actually accelerating the schedule for its first quad core design. There's a dual quad core sitting over there that will uh, help us do one of the, one of the demos. Uh, other companies uh, are announcing similar um, uh, efforts to accelerate their, their multi-core products into the, into the marketplace. And a number of smaller companies uh, are experimenting with, with much more aggressive uh, designs. Uh, here's the, you know, the comment from Azul. There are a number of other companies out there uh, with larger and larger number of, of cores per, per die, you know, hundreds, and there are even a few people uh, out there with thousands of processors. Uh, of course, the, you know, the issue um, we, we have here is that while this, um, all this hardware development is, is taking place, uh, do we really have a, a quantitative foundation for uh, evaluating these, uh, these designs? At Intel, uh, we've had a project going on for the last uh, three or four years that we recently uh, christened the TerraScale uh, project. Um, it's a, you know, a research effort aimed at understanding the architecture issues and the software issues and the platform issues associated with fairly aggressive multi-core uh, designs into the, into the next, uh, next decade. And the illustration here um, is, is simply sort of our straw man architecture. We're assuming a general purpose uh, framework. So here you see a number of uh, Intel arch architecture compatible uh, cores, uh, a fairly sophisticated memory hierarchy, you know, multi-levels of cache, high bandwidth memory interface. Uh, and we also assume the, the presence of some um, fixed function capability accelerating uh, those activities, and I'll leave those uh, f uh, for your um, uh, consideration. Uh, a number of fixed function activities for accelerating those functions uh, for which you know, a programmable solution is not attractive, uh, either from a performance or an energy uh, or both um, point, of, um, point of view. So uh, this is the straw man architecture that uh, that we use to uh, basically focus our research uh, activities for, uh, for TerraScale. What particularly interests us about this architecture is, is not how well it does on legacy codes, but how well it will do on uh, emerging codes, on future codes and, and future applications um, that will be of central interest in the marketplace, uh, let's say in five or, uh, or, or 10 years. 
Uh, and of course, that gets, um, that gets r rather tricky because nobody really knows what those applications are going to look like in, uh, in five or ten years. You know, in some sense, it's, it's anyone's guess. But um, we've decided that uh, we really couldn't sort of leave it to chance uh, in terms of what those future applications might be. Uh, and we decided uh, essentially to do something about it by creating our own suite of applications as well as working with, uh, with various partners uh, to gather uh, the kinds of applications that they felt would be important to them uh, over the, the next five to, to ten years. But we're particularly interested in this, um, this set of new applications, and some of the demos will, will illustrate that, just to give you a sense of what I mean by those kinds of applications. I'm going to start with, uh, with the first demo here. Um, and I'll, let me just, just set this up. Maybe I will use the laser pointer. So if you look at the bottom uh, part of the screen here, um, we have a room with four cameras in it, one to four, across there. And we're going to do a motion tracking on the individual uh, in the room across those, those four cameras. So this doesn't involve, you know, little LEDs on uh, people's shirt sleeves or any, uh, any of that sort of fall to roll. This is, this is just using the input from those video cameras, processing that input, and then synthesizing uh, the motion of this, of this figure uh, using, uh, using ray tracing. So you'll, you'll see the reflections in the mirror and you'll see the shadows moving across the floor. And I'll set that into motion. Now this requires today a lot of offline processing. We're not capable of, uh, of carrying out both uh, the motion tracking and the, and the ray tracing and synthesis uh, to do this in anything close to real time. But obviously that's where we would like to, to be. Someday uh, to be in the position of just placing those cameras and being able to animate that, that figure. And I think you can imagine uh, the various sorts of, uh, of applications uh, in entertainment, in training, other, uh, in other fields where that capability could prove to be uh, quite compelling. So when we look at the, at the architectures that might enable such applications to exist, we see that there are many design uh, challenges. Uh, I mentioned the complex uh, memory hierarchy. Interconnecting all of those cores on the die is going to be some form of sophisticated on-die fabric that will, uh, will route uh, address tra traffic and message traffic between the, between the cores, uh, also provide the links uh, that, go, um, that go off chip. Um, more than likely, there'll be some form of explicit thread uh, support in these architectures, recognizing uh, threads at the hardware level and providing um, accelerations to important thread functions beyond the sorts of things that, uh, that we see uh, in current architectures, and as I mentioned, some amount of fixed function uh, acceleration. Now, all that's good and well, except uh, we really find ourselves lacking the quantitative tools uh, upon which to undertake uh, designs like this and really uh, address the design challenges uh, that are outlined he here, as well as, uh, as many others uh, that you might uh, imagine. Now, that's not to say there haven't been uh, existing efforts to develop a suite uh, of codes to uh, look at multiprocessor uh, designs. And, you know, we're here at Stanford, which is the, the home of the, the splash be benchmarks, <clears throat> take us back about uh, 10, or 12, uh, 10 or 12 years. Um, you know, those were largely HPC-focused. They include, included things like ocean modeling. Uh, there's not a big market in ocean modeling, which is one of the, um, one of the problems, uh, although maybe in certain parts of the world uh, that market might be, uh, might be growing. Uh, TPCC, in fact, many of the server benchmarks uh, are already highly threaded uh, today, but they primarily focus on throughput-oriented action, um, throughput-oriented uh, metrics, basically how many transactions can you process per hour, per minute, per second, as the case, uh, as the case may be, they tend not to look at applications where uh, the work of the, of the processors, the work of the cores, uh, are highly uh, coordinated. So while they, you know, they're important, if you're designing 
uh, for server applications, at least today's server applications, uh, they might not be uh, the right foundation for going forward. Uh, we have the uh, embassy uh, benchmarks, which uh, target embedded applications, and the 3D benchmarks, which do drive actually the design of a lot of, um, <clears throat> well, you may, I guess you can call it highly threaded or uh, SIMD designs for, um, for the graphics processors, but they really are focused on that, um, on that single domain. So, uh, you know, in our efforts to, uh, to find an existing suite and be able to laugh, uh, leverage that one, uh, we really came up short. Now, another alternative, of course, is to just be patient. Um, you know, we're fairly early in this, uh, this multi-core epic, so um, we could just relax and say, well, uh, we'll use what we have and we'll, uh, we'll sort of wait until the base of, uh, of multi-threaded, multi-core applications begin to, uh, you know, begin to build up. And sometime downstream, you know, maybe five years, maybe 10 years uh, from now, there'll be enough of these codes around uh, we can uh, undertake uh, the development of such a suite. But in fact, these designs are on are on the drawing board today, and architects and engineers are asking, uh, you know, tough questions about uh, about their design, and they're really screaming. At least they are at Intel. They're really screaming um, at um, about the need uh, for more applications to help them make the best trade-offs in the in the design of those um, the design of those processors. So. Uh, what would it take, then, this is the question we asked ourselves, what would it take to uh, create a multi-core benchmark? Well, first we knew it was going to take um, some combination of both established and emerging uh, applications. I've already mentioned the server benchmarks being uh, already being highly threaded. Uh, so that's, you know, that's a good example of an established application with an established set of, uh, of benchmarks that, uh, that we could leverage. But because we'd like to be designing for a target five or ten years out, uh, we felt we needed to uh, identify a set of emerging uh, workloads, potentially the future killer applications for um, architectures with, uh, with high core counts. And we'll talk more about the, this, uh, this collection of applications we've la labeled recognition, mining, and synthesis. Uh, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, we also felt uh, it was important that such a benchmark address both performance um, and energy. So uh, I think going forward, all benchmarks uh, probably need to, um, to look at both, at both the performance dimension and the energy efficiency uh, dimension. Um, we needed uh, applications that were both highly threaded as well as highly scalable. And I'll talk about uh, sort of the difference um, in, the, in the choice of applications in just, uh, uh, in just a second. And then finally, we needed a set of both differentiated and stressful applications. So we wanted a suite that really would take um, the architecture that, uh, that I just illustrated and push it uh, into many different, different corners of the, of the application space. We just didn't want to stick to a particular style of, let's say, numerically intensive uh, applications. We want to be looking at visualization tasks. We want to be looking at financial tasks uh, and sort of everything you know, in between. Uh, and we want applications that really push uh, the architecture to, uh, to the limits in the hope of identifying uh, weaknesses in any particular design. You know, let's find the bottlenecks. Uh, let's find the points where um, the architecture really cannot meet the needs of the application. There are some unique challenges associated with creating a multi-core uh, benchmark, uh, and we've certainly uh, encountered them uh, inside of, uh, of Intel. What sort of architecture do we, uh, do we target? Do we, um, do we favor big cores over small cores, for example, out-of-order cores versus in-order cores? Well, the answer to that Again, very much depends on uh, on what it is you're you're trying to do, and you can you can collect benchmarks, you can create benchmarks that sort of naturally favor one to the other. Similarly, are we interested in performance and which 
uh, which architecture delivers the, you know, absolutely the best performance, but maybe tops out in terms of scalability after, any, after only four or eight cores, or do we want architectures uh, that perform well and scale well? That is, uh, they can reach uh, very high core counts um, and be delivering um, good performance and good, uh, good speed-up compute versus I.O. Uh, are they cache-friendly versus memory-intensive? Uh, there are all of these dimensions which simply, that suddenly come into play uh, when you start talking about multi-core benchmarks. And that's why a lot of existing uh, benchmarks really uh, fail you in this sort of the task because they aren't uh, helping you uh, get answers to these, um, to these questions. Let me just spend a minute and talk about this performance versus scalability question. This is actually a real life uh, example. Uh, you know, we were having just this sort of uh, discussion uh, a little more than a, uh, than a year ago. Here you see two algorithms for graph, uh, for graph mining. Um, one has actually very good uh, performance. You can see on the, on the relative throughput uh, axis. It starts high and, um, and continues to scale well out to, uh, to four cores, and then it levels off. Uh, and in fact, <clears throat> that sort of signature uh, of that application was very typical of, of a lot of the codes we just happened to have on hand. Now, why was that? Well, because those codes had been am optimized for a small number of threads, and you know, attention was paid to getting the most, the most uh, performance out of that small thread count. Nobody was really concerned about scaling beyond that because there were no machines that had uh, more processors uh, or more cores available uh, for the work. Another algorithm uh, actually starts much lower in terms of performance, but it actually scales better. And if you put enough cores uh, behind it here, you have to get out to about 16 cores to reach the crossover. Um, it finally reaches the performance of the, of the um, simpler algorithm and then continues, uh, continues to scale uh, from there on. You know, which one of those is the more interesting uh, application? Which one of those should be uh, in the suite? Or do you put both of those in the suite? Another thing that, uh, that we realized as we um, set out to build um, the suite of applications was that um, it's, it's sort of, a, I guess, a trend, a tendency um, you know, for architects to um, forget that um, there's really a co-design process going on here. And, you know, and I think it's, it's particularly true in, in, in multi-core designs, um, although you know, certainly true in others. But in multi-core designs, um, you, you look at a characteristic like this one, this is um, actually right out of the, out of the Intel uh, math library. This is a, a forward solver code. And when you first run this thing, um, you notice that it gets to about 16 cores uh, and then begins to scale down. So 16 cores uh, appears to be sort of the, the useful peak. And typical response from uh, uh, from the designers is, okay, well, that means we don't have to have more than, than 16 cores because even, you know, one of our most aggressive, highly threaded um, numerical kernels uh, doesn't, doesn't scale well past 16. And then you go, but wait, what if we actually did some things in the architecture to improve scaling? So I'm going to walk you through a series of these uh, um, just, to, just to show you how this completely changes one's perspective. What if we added uh, more explicit support for hardware threads in the, in the architecture? Uh, maybe, you know, better scheduling, better synchronization, better communication, uh, what have you. But what if we, we did better? We introduced some uh, direct instruction support. Well, now we're scaling out to 32 cores, and in fact, we don't descale as we go uh, as we go beyond that. So immediately that looks better. What if we took a look at the cache behavior and actually made some adjustments in the way the caches are operating to remove some of the other bottlenecks to, uh, to efficient scaling? Uh, now things are looking much better. Uh, we are getting higher absolute performance, and in fact now we're scaling well uh, out to 
uh, out to 64 cores. And you can see how this begins to change one's perception of, let's say, what the right core or what the right thread target uh, might be. But in fact, we're still not done. And in this particular exercise that we went through, uh, we finally said, well, what if we had certain new instructions that uh, would address um, some of the requirements of that forward solver? So I'm talking about you know, new arithmetic uh, functions. And in fact, when we're all done, now this, this, uh, this graph looks completely different. We're getting good scale up, uh, and we're getting good performance out at, at 64 cores. Uh, we're getting, I think, roughly uh, a factor of 28 uh, improvement uh, in speed up. So, you know, you can't think of these designs as basically static with respect to the algorithm uh, that you're given. In fact, there's a lot of freedom uh, for the architects uh, to go in, analyze the benchmarks in detail, classic quantitative design exercise, go in, analyze, uh, find the bottlenecks, look at the architectural opportunities, fix those, those opportunities, and iterate again. And that's exactly uh, the exercise that you, that you see here, and I think one that's, that's fundamental. Okay, well, let me come back to this issue of, uh, of these emerging applications, potentially the killer applications for platforms five or 10 years uh, into the future. Um, we've been describing these for, uh, for some time now. Uh, as, uh, as falling into three broad categories. This is recognition, mining, and, uh, and synthesis. And I'm gonna walk through uh, each of these in, you know, in a little more detail. Um, while we think this is, a, this is sort of a very rich environment in which to work in a very uh, rich framework in which to consider future applications, we're not saying all applications fit nicely into these three categories, but it does appear as though a number of fairly compelling applications actually uh, follow the recognition, mining, and synthesis uh, model, what we call the RMS suite uh, at Intel. So let me start uh, with, uh, with the first one of these. This is uh, recognition. We call this the what is it task. Um, and this is basically modeling and identifying um, a particular uh, a particular type of object um, using more and more multimodal data. In fact, the example that um, I've chosen here is a multimodal speech rec recognition example uh, where we're doing, you know, sort of classic uh, audio-driven speech recognition as well as doing lip tracking uh, on, the, on the speaker, fusing those two data streams to improve accuracy actually to improve robustness in a, in a high noise uh, environment. And I think... Zero, I one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Five, zero, six, nine, two, eight, one, three, seven, four. And just a series of numbers. Now the same series of numbers except with um, just doing the lip tracking. Now what's interesting about that, I wish we could freeze that, but and what's interesting about that is that the performance of the lip tracking is almost as good as the audio piece. Kind of reminds you of, of, uh, of Hal in, uh, in 2001 uh, as he's watching them talk in the, in the, in the pod. Uh, the significant thing is when you fuse those two streams, the recognition of those two streams, you get significantly better uh, improvement. Basically, the signal-to-noise ratio is, is dramatically improved. And that's, that's a, I think, a, kind of a classic example of, um, of multimodal recognition as we see uh, taking place sometime in the future, where both the speech track as well as the video track um, are uh, processed and, and recognized uh, for those fragments. And who, is, who knows, maybe we'll get so good at, at, the, at the video recognition, um, you know, we might not need the audio recognition. Well, probably not. 
Um, the next one of these applications is the, um, the mining application, which is, okay, now that I've got this model, maybe I actually have a, a multimodal uh, model, um, you know, how do I find an instance of that uh, model in a sea of data? So this is a classic, you know, sort of where is it problem, searching for a familiar instance, and Doyle is going to come out here, I guess, I don't need this, put that down. Thanks, Morning, Doyle. Justin. How are you? Always good to see you. Good to see you as well. Um, okay, so we've got a, uh, an example of, uh, of mining here. This is a, a database of photographs. Why don't you kind of give us the, the background here? I'll give you the lowdown here. So I've got about 5,000 photos in this database. And um, to, in order to find those photos, typical applications today are just using by date sequences, or you can tag your photos mm -hmm. so that you can uh, reference those in the future. Well, so in my example where I've got 5,000 photos on this machine, if I want to go back and try to find, let's say, a picture of some dolphins that I know I've taken some great shots of, but I can't remember when, what I can do is start gathering some photos that are good examples um, that may hone in on this. Like, for example, I remember that there was a fair amount of blue in it because it was a picture of water. So I'm going to drag that up here to a good example okay. and then do a query. And you can see that that pulled up several pieces of uh, blue photography and, and helped me out here. So here's another good example of a couple of dolphins. And so I'm going to drag that up here and query again. That helps me out even further. Um, if I want to hone down a little bit even further, well, here's a bad example. I don't really need pictures of uh, blue sky and buildings, so mm -hmm. let me do one more query. Oh, picked up another one. Yeah. And so there's another good picture of the dolphin, and there's the one that I'm kind of looking for is this one jumping out of the uh, water. And so you can see, instead of having to look through several thousand images and finding the one that I can, just by looking at different um, textures and content that we can re-index these on the, in pre-index these, I should say. Right. And then for future reference, the finding these photos via textures and colors and that sort of thing is much faster. So how much time did it take to do the, do the pre-indexing operation? So this one's got about 5,000 photos. We did a test the other night and had about 10,000 photos and it took almost 20 hours to index it. Okay. So you come home from vacation, plug in your video, your digital camera, download your uh, content, let it index overnight, and the next morning you'd be ready to start searching. Okay. And then the, the searching seems to be very fast. And very intuitive. Once right. you've got that indexed, they've indexed everything that has common textures, common colors. Um, there's even additional features that they're looking at, like facial recognition. Um, mm -hmm. So you can pick up pictures of, of certain individual faces, that sort of thing. Okay. So sounds great. Thanks. Thank you, Justin. All right. Thanks, Doyle. All right. So that's a good example of the kind of mining application we'd like to perform. And of course, we'd like to be uh, doing both the the, the pre-indexing and the searching uh, much faster than we're doing it here over much larger databases. So that's the that's the challenge going forward. Um, let me. Um, talk about the sorts of data we're deriving uh, from these exercises, and then I'll come back uh, and, and give you um, several examples in the, in the synthesis uh, area. So uh, we have two cases here, uh, and I, I mean, this is just sort of the top level, of course, kind of, uh, kind of analysis. So one of them is video surveillance, and one of them is, uh, is the body tracking that you saw in the, in the earlier examples. And, uh, here we've set certain requirements on the kind of, uh, you know, kind of uh, speed um, rate at which we'd like to perform these, uh, these tasks, both the, excuse me, both the body tracking uh, as well as the, as the video uh, surveillance. So uh, video surveillance uh, is slightly under, uh, under 10 gigaflops. The, um, uh, the body tracking is uh, getting upwards to three or 400. Uh, gigaflops. The right-hand diagram is, is one of the things that, uh, that we get a, give a lot of attention to, which is what sort of memory bandwidth uh, is, uh, is required here. And you can see video surveillance is not, uh, is not too bad. Uh, between 1 and 10 
uh, gigabytes per second. But the body tracking example is actually a very uh, demanding one, uh, memory intensive application that's, uh, that's well over 100 gigabytes per second of bandwidth. So the, these multi-core machines in the future are gonna require dramatically better uh, memory systems than what we, uh, what we have today. And I would, you know, uh, I would say this is one of the key areas uh, for multi-core design going forward. Well, let's turn to uh, the S in RMS, which is, uh, which is synthesis. Uh, this is sort of putting these models into motion and being able to answer the, the what if questions. Now, you may not always think about synthesis as being a, a what if kind of question, but uh, you know, this is taking the model and, you know, and putting it into motion, running it forward uh, in time. We have, uh, we have a couple of examples here, we're gonna look at, uh, we'll start with the, with the case in the middle, um, which uh, is based on code from, uh, from Intrace. Uh, this, um, a similar demonstration, not the identical demonstration, was done um, at Intel's developer forum uh, a few years ago. We had, um, we had quite a, uh, a large cluster, I think a 48 uh, node cluster. Here we're doing it with a four node cluster. And uh, you can see it's, uh, this is four nodes, four processors uh, per node. And we're just gonna do a fly in. This is all static data, so we're just moving the camera position. And this is being done in real time, so you're sort of looking at you know, the state of the art in real time ray tracing. Here, we'll fly around the VW. You can see all the highlights and shadows and reflections. And I think we'll end up here tight on the, on the rear tail light. You can see how accurately we've modeled all of the reflections and bouncing around inside of the, the tail light. And the processors have been uh, extremely busy carrying out that, uh, out that task. So uh, for, for CAD applications, for example, I mean, this is sort of the, you know, the classic problem, not quite at real time at this point, but you know, not too bad. We're getting uh, within, let's say, a, a quarter of, uh, of real time uh, performance. This is also, I think, an excellent example of architecture algorithm co-design. Uh, as we've been working on ray tracing for a number of years now, uh, we've gone back and forth between architecture and algorithm. The algorithms uh, are easily a factor of 100 more efficient today than where we were just, just a few years ago, and there's probably another factor of 10 uh, to be had, and again, that has a huge impact on um, the conclusions you draw in, a, in an architectural exercise. So if we can look at the next one. Again, real-time ray tracing, but this is a true animation. So this is the kind of ray tracing challenge you might face if you wanted to use ray tracing as the rendering technique in a, um, in a video game. So here the figures are moving, and yet we're modeling all the shadows and, and reflections and multiple light sources and, and so on. This is running on a dual quad-core uh, machine over here, what we call a, a Clovertown, that system uh, right there. And it's achieving between six and 10 frames uh, per second. So again, we're not at real time, but we're getting, we're getting reasonably close. And it's, it's not uh, unrealistic to expect that before the end of the decade, uh, we'll be able to do that kind of animation in, um, in real time. Okay, well, thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> so let's, uh, we have one more, and this is uh, from Professor Rod FedQ here at Stanford. This is um, some of the, the fluid dynamics. So if I can have that. Or do I do that? Am I? Yes, sorry. I had the button on that one. We'll let that run, uh, run a few times. So, um, you know, this is fluid flow uh, simulation, basically uh, a physics code. Running 
here. All right, so three examples. I guess do I? I guess I get out of it. Uh, three examples of uh, uh, of high quality uh, synthesis that uh, is still not at the performance level we'd like it to be, but does appear to be within range of uh, these future architectures um, that we're we're working on. Here are some of the the data from uh, a couple of different ray tracing examples. You saw the um, the beetle scene um, that requires for for real time performance, and I think real time here was described as about 70 frames per second. It's uh, well in excess of a, of a teraflop, getting up into um, about the five teraflop uh, regime. Uh, memory bandwidth um, with the approach with the appropriate caching architecture is not too bad. In fact. Uh, we've done a lot of work studying the design of caches uh, in ray tracing workloads. And uh, in fact, with, uh, with effective cache architecture, you can actually do this kind of very high quality image rendering uh, at reasonable uh, or at least uh, you know, uh, available uh, memory uh, bandwidth. So uh, that's actually, I think, uh, good news from this, from this exercise and, and underscores the importance of having a wide range of, um, of codes available in the suite. Um, here's uh, some of the fluid uh, flow examples. Again, um, you know, very high uh, computational levels from half a teraflop uh, to over 10 teraflops. Um, that's for uh, um, a fluid dynamics example on a 150 by 100 by 100 grid running at 30 frames per second. And in contrast to the ray tracing, here are the memory bandwidth uh, levels uh, are, uh, are quite high, uh, 100 gigabytes per second for um, the simpler, slower example and, and over a terabyte uh, per second for the more complex example. So uh, quite a range of memory demands. And that's why I, I said a very diverse set of workloads is important in this exercise uh, because simply looking at a narrow space might convince you, oh, well, you know, if I have a few uh, tens of gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth, I'm fine. And then you encounter a problem like this and you're, you're way under provision from a memory point of view. So um, this is sort of the state of the RMS suite at, uh, at Intel. These are uh, the example codes, uh, sort of heavily numeric on the left and heavily non-numeric uh, on the right as we look at, uh, at various documents and uh, and bioinformatics, looking at, uh, at genetic sorts of uh, things, uh, graph mining, and, um, and so forth. Um, so this is what we've been able to achieve in the last three or four years. Some of these codes were developed inside the company, and a number of these codes were developed outside the company, uh, working in, uh, in partnerships with, uh, with the Intel uh, team. And it was sort of the existence of, of this suite that really kicked off this conversation that I had with, uh, with Kai earlier in the, in the year. Um, we also include uh, a number of, of primitives in the RMS suite. And this is uh, you know, kind of a, a, um, a high level summary of all, the, of all the primitives. Many of these applications use a range of, uh, of solution methods, various solvers, uh, what have you, and all of them are important and need to be uh, optimized uh, for, uh, for high thread count machines. So a lot of work has gone in to sort of this level of the, of the suite exercise uh, as well. So we have a, a solid foundation of, if you will, library functions upon which we can build, uh, we can build the full applications. Now, not every application you saw today or every application on the previous list makes use of these solvers, but they occur, uh, they occur frequently. And it's interesting um, to look at how many of these are used in recognition and synthesis or in mining and synthesis. We find that a lot of these, um, these primitives play multiple roles uh, in the implementation of the, of the RMS suite. So uh, the, uh, the prospect of, uh, of taking the Intel suite uh, public 
uh, was, uh, was the subject of this conversation I had with, uh, with Kai. And I said, well, you know, there are problems with, with taking the, the suite public because a lot of these codes are not, uh, are not really Intel codes. Uh, they really belong to uh, a number of our partners, many of whom uh, consider these codes um, part of their intellectual property. They're of a proprietary nature, uh, and we'd be hard-pressed uh, to you know, put these codes in the, in the public domain. Yet without these codes, uh, the suite uh, would not have this, um, this high uh, degree of differentiation that I, that I spoke to. Uh, so you know, from that grew this notion of creating a public uh, RMS suite may not be called the RMS suite, uh, but uh, I think that sort of gives you the notion of, of what, we're, what we're talking about. And in fact, we've, we've gone around somewhat informally uh, of late, uh, talking to various folks about their willingness to, uh, to contribute to um, this, uh, this public RMS suite. Uh, we'll contribute uh, some of our own codes to it. So here you see on the, on the list, um, you know, we're talking about contributing our, our body tracking code and our ray tracing uh, code. Uh, University of Pittsburgh, who we've been working with on some of these data mining uh, tasks, uh, has agreed to contribute their cancer cell uh, detection code. Um, Berkeley, uh, Dave Patterson has agreed to uh, contribute a number of the codes uh, that they've been working on. Uh, Professor Fedke, Ron Fedke from here at Stanford. Uh, will contribute his, uh, his physical uh, simulation uh, codes. So what we're here uh, to ask for today is basically um, for those of you here and uh, you know, for people that you're in contact with uh, to give some thought to contributing a code to the creation of this, uh, of this public uh, RMS, uh, RMS suite and let us build a, um, a base of, of really powerful codes, uh, really relevant and important codes that can help guide us both in our research and in our product development in the years ahead. Let me uh, ask Kai to come up here for just, uh, just a few minutes. I asked him if I could impose on him. Um, so here we are <laughs> some months later uh, from, our, from, our little, uh, from our little conversation at, uh, at Princeton. Uh, and recently, you've, uh, you've made an offer. Why don't you tell us uh, about what you're going to do here? Yeah. Um, well, uh, J.P. Singh, uh, whom some of you probably know that, who is the author of uh, Splash Benchmarks. So J.P. and I uh, have been working with graduate students at Princeton and create um, a benchmark suite for uh, multi-core um, processors. And so I have a conversation we just, you know, we, our effort at Princeton are mostly trying to focus on the effort that not overlapping with Intel. So we're focusing on uh, system server applications that have a lot of uh, uh, disk and uh, network IOs because uh, DMA do affect cache behavior. And we also are interested in hosting um, a benchmark that can be the repository of uh, many contributions and uh, working with Intel and many other uh, companies. So uh, if you're interested in doing so, please uh, send me an email. My email will be last name, lee at princeton.edu. And also we're interested in um, organizing a workshop on benchmarking for multi-cores. Uh, we're currently considering organizing that workshop uh, in conjunction with HPCA that's uh, typically in February. And uh, if the timing doesn't work out, we'll try to work out a uh, workshop in conjunction with ISICA, which will be in June next year. And if you're interested in uh, helping with the workshop and participating or co-organizing, uh, please also contact me. All right, well, thanks for your offer. Yeah. We'll look forward <laughs> to that you, workshop. Joseph. All right, thanks, Kai. All right, so just to, just to conclude, um, as the, the march to, uh, to multi-core continues, even, even accelerates, I think it's important as a, as a community that we come, we come together uh, to really create a, a powerful suite of, uh, of benchmarks to drive uh, our architectural work, our design work, and 
Uh, and really, our software and algorithm work, as I've, as I've mentioned. I think the two working in combination are really fundamental to the, to the long-term success of, uh, of the technology and fundamental to the long-term success of the, of the industry. So we hope many of you will join us in, uh, in creating uh, the suite and look forward to working with Kai and, the, and JP and the team at, at Princeton on building the repository and look forward to the, the workshop sometime in the spring. I'm hopeful we can make it earlier in the spring as opposed to later in the spring. Uh, but we'll be, we'll be bringing, um, be bringing our set of codes and we hope uh, as well as, as a number of others and we hope many of you uh, will have codes or know of people who have codes and, and be able to bring them forth at uh, that time. I, I have been able to touch um, a number of people in the, um, in the industry uh, who have codes but just you know aren't quite at the point where they're willing to release them uh, at least them release them publicly but I'm uh, I'm optimistic that in fact we'll have a number of uh, both high quality industrial codes as well as high quality academic codes so thank you very much and I'll be happy to take your questions <laughs> looks like you're first Carl Thank you, Justin. Thanks for a nice talk. I was talking to a friend of mine at Microsoft, and he says, well, we figured it out. We're going to, next 10 years, we're going to have to rewrite all our software. Our problem is we need a general <laughs> purpose solution, okay, as opposed to particular little applications, okay. We need a replacement for relational databases and object-oriented programming. However, we don't know what the solution is yet. But could you please design a multi-core architecture that will work well when we figure it out? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've gotten the same lecture. <laughs> so what do you do? Well, I, I think this, you know, this is really, really the starting point. Uh, you know, and you know, that's why I said, hey, you have to start with a straw man. So, you know, we've, st we've, started, with, uh, we've started with a straw man. Uh, you know, other than sort of that very kind of high-level description, um, you know, not, you know, not too much, you know, in the way of assumptions, uh, assumptions going in, um, and of course, then the first thing was, okay, what sort of codes are we trying to run? Um, also, what kind of, and I think this is more the sort of the Microsoft issue, what sort of programming languages are going to be used to build applications for machines? Uh, of this sort, so we, you know, we've got a number of variables we're we're working, and I should have said if you look in the suite, uh, you know, the you know the different codes are written in you know all sorts of different uh, different languages, some for the you know some for the better and some for the worse. So I, you know it's a huge challenge. I can't you know I can't overstate the challenge, but you have to get started someplace. And, and right, I think the that's, other problem they have is that they have, then have to bring this whole thing to the hoi polloi just about, you know, ordinary software engineers have to be able to program that, this stuff, and that's not gonna happen with uh, C Sharp and Java. Well, that's right, and I, and I think, but we're starting to see, um, we're starting to see the emergence, I, I, I think I probably went past it a little bit uh, quickly, we're starting to see the emergence of, of some useful frameworks, I think, you know, not uh, necessarily the, the most elegant things we can imagine, but things like MapReduce are, you know, are useful frameworks. And in fact, I think uh, some of the machine learning examples in the Intel suite are based on our own implementation of MapReduce. MapReduce, um, Microsoft is working on on similar versions to try to make these machines more accessible to ordinary programmers. Yeah. Why don't I Thank you. take another question over here? Uh, Thanks, Na Carl. Nagy Mikhail from Ryerson University in Toronto. Do you think the multi-core uh, architecture is suitable for high-speed uh, processors in which uh, the speed of the processor is a fraction of nanoseconds, but when those multi-core, multi-threads goes outside to a shared bus or shared memory, the overhead could be much more uh, 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 penalties than the uh, fraction of nanoseconds that the multi-core will run in. Did you try to uh, simulate or uh, run the core slower, uh, slow down the, the core speed and find out the scalability of your system? You, you indicated that there are difference between per performance yeah, the, and scalability. Okay, if, if I follow your question, it, uh, you know, it was really, did, I think, sort of based on this, you know, doing things on chips very fast. Right. Fractions of nanoseconds, whereas right. going off chip is, right. you know, tens, hundreds. 
of, of nanoseconds. Um, we, we, you know, we certainly have looked at that. We, we, you know, we certainly looked at that from the, you know, from the, from the um, memory subsystem performance um, perspective. But the, the examples here, and most of our work have, have really concentrated on, you know, doing as much work as possible on, you know, on one die. Uh, because the, you know, the penalties for going off, I think, as you were suggesting, uh, are extremely high. Now, that's not to say, you know, you couldn't, uh, if you'll permit me, you know, cluster uh, processors of, uh, of this sort, but there you're going to have to be very conscious of, of data distribution in particular, so, you know, most of the data uh, that a, a group of cores require uh, is located, you know, very close um, to the um, to the processor die. Thank you. Right. Uh, my question relates to the slide that have the financial uh, forward. Uh, uh, the forward solver on financial. Yes, yeah. yes. So if I recall the numbers there, you know, going from, for example, 16 to 32 to 64, the very last, you know, of the. Right. Even though you know you try to retain the scale back again, you know, to to keep going in the performance. It looked to me like you know you are actually approaching like a 25 percent with doubling the number of cores, so that means a technology gen node generation. So isn't that like you know much less than what you expect? Maybe just by speeding up the frequency, 25 percent, like you know what you can get from nowadays you know technology. So so doubling the number of cores happen every generation of the technology, right? Every node of the technology. Well, yeah, I think, okay, let's back up. Uh, you know, I mean, what's motivating this move to multi-core is the fact that the single thread performance is not increasing at the, at the historical level. So, right, but so, that was like 2x every generation node. Now 25%, you can still get frequency up 25% each generation. You don't think uh, I so? Think, I, think it's, I think it's going to be very, very challenging okay. over, over this time frame to do so, it. So regardless, you know, this looks like very modest with respect to what we have seen, the 2x in, from the frequency. So are we saying that, you know, scaling with the multi-core will only get us 25%, you know, down the no, road? No, no, no. Not, not 25%. That was that was a speed up. That was I mean I don't I don't remember the exact number of time, but that was a speed up of 25 right. with when, 64 processors. Right, but the previous. Can, can you go to that? So you get 20x 32, but when you go from 32 32 to 64, you get 25x. So that's 5x over 20. Oh, it's much further back, yeah. Oops. Right. Oops. That one. Okay. So going from 32 to 64, which is that doubling of the, you know. So whatever you get up to 32, Going to the next generation to get 64, it looks to me like you're getting. No, 25%. these are not. I'm, man, I'm really confused. These are not generational. This is one architecture. They're just introducing additional features yeah, into the I mean, architecture to improve the scalability I, I of the algorithm. understand, but you know, number of cores, right? 32 to 64. You actually achieve that usually when you go, accord, you know, with Moore's law from one chip to the other to keep the same area, right? That's the whole notion of you know increasing oh, the number oh, of cores. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm I, just saying, you know, you are not actually, okay, as, as you go to the, to the <laughs> scaling, you're getting diminishing returns. <laughs> okay, I don't think, I don't think you, you know, you should attack the, you know, the whole premise here on the basis of this one slide. This was, this, the, the, the purpose of the slide was simply to illustrate how the, the conclusion you might draw from the initial well, study drawing, is, yeah, is misleading. I'm, I'm drawing a bigger conclusion. Even after you did all this, you know, improvements, and even after, you know, we went through the whole problems of multi-core yeah. programming, yeah. I'm getting on, only 25%. And this, this, you know, a forward solver is a, is a very difficult code to get even that kind of scaling. But don't, don't you know, go to the bank with just that one example. Justin, you still the input size, or is that all the same input size? Or is that the same 
No, that's the same problem. Same problem. I'm sorry? Yeah. Yeah. You know, we weren't trying to illustrate everything on one slide. Just this, you know, it's this interesting dynamic with, you know, uh, with the product designers, at least in Intel, and I assume elsewhere, right? Because, you know, they'll take the code right out of the library, and they'll, they'll come to the initial conclusion. And, you know, and they won't stop and say, well, maybe if I actually address the bottlenecks, just as we've, we've done for decades with single-threaded machines, I can improve the scalability. It's sort of this mindset there's an inherent scalability, uh, and it really can be addressed with architecture. So, uh, Justin, the, the codes that you described, I would sort of put in a category of you don't have to do your computation correct for the result to be valid. You know, so if I get one pixel wrong here or there in this frame, things are cool. If yeah, I get, for some of them. You know, some, some results. So are they, I would actually say most of them are like that, okay? I'm I would say most of them fall in that general category. Are there examples of codes where you have to get your computation right for the result to be valid, that we can get this kind of scalability parallelism? In? Yeah, I think, well, okay, Pradeep is saying all of the, all the financial, uh, all the financial uh, codes um, require it. You know, I don't know if I'd go quite that far. But, but I think that's, I think, you know, that's not an unreasonable observation, that a, a lot of these um, codes really are sort of driven by, by being uh, statistically correct as opposed to absolutely correct. I think, that's, I think that's fair. That changes a lot of the dynamics of everything, which is probably a good thing. So. And, and I think actually that's, that's very much the the future direction for applications. I think a lot of them will have that characteristic. Let me come back over here. I'm, by the way, I'm not in charge of the master clock, so you guys just pull me off here. Um, Yusuf Abdelgani from Apple. Um, one question regarding the benchmarking and creating benchmarks for multiple cores. Um, is your team going to release the multiple core benchmarks out to the? I'm sorry, you faded Are you out. going to release the multiple core benchmarks the RMS benchmark to the community? And if it is, is it going to just run on one platform or there is support to run it on multiple platforms? <laughs> I, can, I can't hear it. Are you releasing the benchmarks on certain platforms? Are you going to No, I, that was the point. We, we, can't, we can't release our suite because it's this combination of Intel, develop code, and um, you know, external code. Uh, I don't want to say third-party code, but external code, and so right, we can you know we can consider releasing selected elements that are of, of you know Intel unique design, and that's the whole idea of, of working with the community, uh, with the repository at, at Princeton to to put a number of of our codes into that suite, and then working with companies like your company. To you know, add additional codes to the to the suite, right? I mean, so we've you know we've we've built ours, but you know, not with the notion that it's going to be publicly available. Uh, but I think we can agree that having a suite of that sort, maybe even a better suite publicly available, would be worthwhile. Okay. Right. Two more. So okay. my question is. Massively parallel computing is one place where there are a lot of cores running today. So I'm wondering how, do you see that as a development ground for the software that's going to eventually move into the multiple core CPUs? And if so, what are the main differences that you see in moving massively parallel applications where they're in, you know, a data center size computer onto something like your, what did you call it, Cloverleaf server here, where you have oh, the two CPU, hand? yeah. With the, what, what do you see as the main differences moving applications from a massively parallel, like data center, onto a computer where you have multiple cores? Okay, uh, well, I'm, I'm, when you talk about massively parallel data center, you're talking, you know, about high performance computing right. machines? Yeah. Um, well, uh, you know, that's, I think it's entirely practical. Many of those applications are written in um, uh, things like MPI that, 
you know, run on you know machines of of this size. Will almost certainly run on these these future machines that that uh, that I'd been describing. Um, I think my my earlier comment about sort of the relevance of of HPC codes had to do more with the commercial opportunities associated with uh, with those codes. You know, ocean modeling is is important to us, the small community of ocean modelers, but you know not to um, you know not to the uh, broader uh, markets. So while some of the codes that we have in our suite you could consider, um, uh, you know, uh, engineering codes or technical codes, um, we've, you know, we've tried to keep that sort of number under control and really focus on uh, applications and their underlying algorithms that we believe will drive a, a set of you know, more com commercially uh, interesting and compelling applications. Right. Uh, yeah, so you, you started the talk by saying that you know, we could put uh, potentially 100 or 500 cores on a chip. So that leads me to imagine that uh, 10 years from now, uh, you, we could be running half a million threads on a particular chip or on a set of chips on a board. Um, so what is your view or your company's view on uh, when uh, utility computing, grid computing will happen, wherein, you know, the model is people are only have interfaces and all the computing is out there in some central data center servers? Yeah. Are you going to enable Have, it Haven't you added? noticed how politicians now say, I won't answer a what-if question? <laughs> so, um, no, no, I, I uh, you know, I... I think my comment really had to do with the fact that that there were you know there were a number of small companies out there offering systems with uh, you know with with core counts already in the you know in the tens of processors. A few were out there with hundreds and you know uh, uh, and maybe you know one or two talking about talking about thousands. Um, you know I, I don't think it it's as unreasonable to expect by um, you know by the middle of the of the next decade. Um, that you know we'll have many you know in in high volume systems we'll have many tens of cores maybe you know maybe approaching uh, um, you know the few hundreds of cores and probably thousands of hardware supported uh, threads. Uh, I'm a little concerned that we may find ourselves in a bit of a core race, if you will, that each manufacturer tries to outdo the other one in terms of in terms of core count. Uh, really, before um, the um, the software tools and the applications have have caught up uh, with that, but um, you know, from everything we can see from you know from this exercise here, there there are certainly plenty of interesting things to do with tens of cores and hundreds of threads, and you know that's where you know we're targeted um, in terms of the research I described this morning. All right. Thanks very much. <laughs>